Hanukkah is connected to the taking back of the temple from the Assyrian king Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Epiphanes means God manifest, a foreshadow of the anti-Messiah. Hanukkah is the second of the two festivals created by the sages. Purim is the other one. These were created by the sages. The sages debated whether or not to have extra festivals. This debate took place during the period of the first dispersion in regards to Purim. After the return to the land of Israel during the second temple period, Hanukkah's observance occurred. The debate ended whether it was permissible with the sages' authority to have this festival that represented the salvation of the people. Festival of Lights, Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah represents this. Now watch this. So we're going to get to something interesting because I, I wanted to get past all the, the bickering and fighting and just look at some principal historical things. Even with a friend of mine that came down you know, uh, to speak, to say, we, we have to have some discussions on some things. But look at Hanukkah represents the altar, the wall, and the house. The altar, the wall, and the house. Now watch this being taken back from the pagan worship of the world. Remember, the altar, the wall, and the house. The pagan world system represented by the image in Daniel chapter 3. The sun comes to restore the house and the wall and the altar and destroys the image of jealousy found in many churches and religions today. So Hanukkah represents the destroying of images and the taking back of the altar of Yah Restoring the walls of Yah and restoring the house of Yah. The principle of these things. That's why when we get together, you know, we, we, ha we have a, a fun time. Like today we're going to have a fun time. Right, Brandy? <laughs> She's like, hurry up. <laughs> we have a fun time today. But we cannot, as people, mistake this historic account with just a day of, we're, 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 we're giving gifts to each other because it's almost like a Christmas attachment. We need to focus on the physical aspect of this historical account, but not disregard some of the other things. Because if you notice something, when they rededicated the altar, the walls, and the house, they brought gifts for eight days. They brought gifts. It was, at that time, they weren't wrapped. They were brought as animals. They were brought as vegetation. They were brought. So you have between these two worlds of collision today, you have a truth that is actually embedded in there that we can embrace in a, a remembrance of a historical thing that actually took place. Hanukkah means dedication. Hanukkah is an annual festival of Israel which is celebrated on, the, on eight successive days that celebrates even during this time of silence. It begins on the 25th day of Kislev in the Hebrew calendar, corresponding approximately to the time of December in the Gregorian calendar. Also known as the Festival of Lights, the Feast of Dedication, and the Feast of the Maccabees, Hanukkah commemorates the rededication of the Temple of Jerusalem by Judah Maccabee in 165 B.C., after the temple had been profaned by Antiochus Epiphanes, king of Syria and overlord of Palestine. You know, I was challenged this week by a pastor. Real interesting. I don't talk about too much unless they ask. And he had a friend with him, and I think he was trying to, to mock me. And, um, I, and I caught that. And he said, hey, and he knew I don't eat pork and I don't, I don't do any of those things, right? shellfish and, and whatnot. We try to live a kosher life to the best that we can in this fallen world. And he says, hey, um, hey, Pastor John, he says, come here. He says, hey, uh, hey, why don't you eat pork again? He opened the can of worms, right? Or we could say he opened up the Pandora box right then and there. So I said, let me ask you a question. I said, <clears throat> Would you permit, and this is okay to say, because it, it, it's, it's in this country, we see it, there's, there's a, people practicing certain lifestyles that are abominations, if I can put it like that. So I mentioned in detail, without offending people, I don't want to offend anyone, so there's certain, and I give them the details, there's a certain type of lifestyle that's being practiced that's worldwide, like, like Sodom and Gomorrah today. I said, do you believe a believer should practice that lifestyle? Now that they know the truth of what God's word says, he said, no. I said, do you know that putting pig in our mouth is the same type 
of category as that, and it's called an abomination. I said, why do we pick and choose? Why are we picking and choosing these types of things? Right, Philip? Philip had the same situation kind of go down. So Philip encouraged me. I said, why do we pick and choose these types of things? I said, here's another thing. All we need to do, if we're the temple of God, because I didn't want to bash them, I wanted to lift them up. I said, you're the temple of, the, of Elohim, and the spirit of Yah dwells in you. And the spirit of Yah dwells in me. If we are the temple of Yah, I said, and back then in the temple of Solomon and so on and so forth, they didn't bring anything unclean in that temple. What the Father was trying to teach them with that is, because you brought some unclean things inside of your life through idolatrous practices, now you have to be behind this stone wall trying to do religious services that were never intended. I said, if you're the temple of Yah, and if you're the temple of Yah watching on the internet as well, then I want to encourage you that whatever the Father says to put in that temple, how much more we put in this one. Whatever doesn't go in that temple that is made of stone, how much more does that not go in this temple? that is made of flesh and not made by the hands of men. So we need to understand these types of things. And it, it actually brought clarity. It brought clarity to where he said that he had a holy atomic bomb given to him today. So whatever that meant, I don't know. But we need to bring clarity to our brothers and sisters. But moving on. In 171 B.C., Antiochus IV came to, to the Seleucid throne in Syria. He was a tyrant. I, I left a lot out because you guys know the story, but because it's this season, I want to read it anyways. And it, it just, it's just this time so we can uh, hear these things. And maybe someone's watching doesn't know. He was a tyrant, cruel, harsh, and savage. He wore his pride like a garment, believing that he was a deity in the flesh. That's what epiphanies mean. And he referred to himself as Antiochus Theos Epiphanes or Antiochus God Manifest. His detractors called him a pimenus, or madman. Without warning, Israel found herself exposed to his intolerant rule, a foreshadowing of the coming Antichrist, and they began to kill people off if they would not just eat a pork sandwich. If they would not be Hellenized. If they would not, and being Hellenized is taking upon the ways of the Greeks and the Romans and making that your religious practice in a nutshell. That's what Hellenization is. And this is what this man was bringing. He was Hellenizing the people that he would overcome. For, Helen, for Hellenism was far more than just Greek philosophy and ordered society of mytho, uh, mythological gods and promoted widespread immorality in the worship of those gods. They would have sexual orgies, all this disgusting stuff. The Orthodox party was committed to preserving the schools of Hillel and Shammai at that time. And the pure worship of the Elohim of Israel, and as a matter of fact, Yeshua went to the school of Hillel. He went through the school of Hillel. Yeshua did. They saw only, excuse me, of the schools of Shillel and Hamai, uh, of Shammai. Conversely, there were those of the progressive Hellenist party. They included many of the aristocracy, uh, aristocracy, I can't even pronounce that word. Aristocracy, right? Elite group, I, I had to look it up, so I put it's an elite group, a new world order, who had little concern for the faith of their fathers. They saw only the economic and social advantages of appearing enlightened, civilized, and accepted by the advanced nations throughout the world which embraced Hellenism. Today you have what's called the Blue Earth Project, and certain things happening in Colorado with underground uh, caverns. And there's an a, a interesting thing happening that's going to come out real, real soon that they've been doing for a long time. But check it out. The Blue Pro Planet Project, and it's not dealing with Save the Whales. It goes way beyond that. And you'll see what I'm talking about. It all comes together. Therefore, these Hellenists desired Syrian rule along with the, the embraced Hellenism Therefore, these Hellenists desired Syrian rule with the Greek culture. This group willingly forsook or they apostatized the Holy Covenant. The victory over Antiochus Epiphanes more than 2,000 years ago, Judea, uh, the land of Judea, was ruled by Antiochus, a tyrannical Syrian king, and he was taken over by the Maccabean brothers, as we know. All right? They overtook him. They took the, the altar back. That was the first thing. They took the walls back. They began to rebuild, and they took the house of Elohim back. 
from the ways of this pagan man, this is going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Everything is being set up. Hurry up. Hurry up. It's like this. Hurry up and set the altar up so that we can defile it. Basically. Hurry up. Because that's the first thing that was defiled. They broke through the, the front door, and the first thing defiled, they knew if we defile that altar by putting a statue of Zeus there, an image of jealousy, and then we offer up something that is unclean on that altar, then we have this place here. So look at this. Hanukkah and Christmas. There's no biblical basis or fact for December 25th being the birth of the Messiah. In fact, for 300 years, the early church viewed the celebration of Christmas. And I, I had to put this in here because I've had some people ask questions today. Is there proof that Christmas was something pagan? If there's not, I'm going to keep doing it. So I, had, I said, let me get something in case these people are watching and they're blessed to understand. This is historical evidence. In fact, for 300 years, the early church viewed the celebration of Christmas as a heathen custom. Yet the dates of Hanukkah and Christmas are connected. They're right next to each other. Zeus was seen as the incarnation of the sun together with his goddess mother, Rhea, the queen of heaven. They formed the Greek version of the mother-child cult found in Babylon. Antiochus chose the 25th of the month to desecrate the temple with his pagan sacrifices because it was the birthday of Zeus. And it was the winter solstice when the days began to lengthen. Sun worshiping began, therefore celebrated the 25th as the birthday of the new sun. To the sun worshiping Romans, Zeus was known as Jupiter, which some think is the apostle Peter in certain Catholic settings. It's Jupiter. He was the son of Saturn in Ups. He was the supreme Roman deity and the father of the pagan gods. December 17th to the 24th was called Saturnalia, the honor of Saturn, and celebrated with unrestrained license. The Romans celebrated December 25th with the birthday of Zeus as Dies Natalis Invicti Solis, the day of the nativity of the unconquered sun. In the 4th century A.D., the Roman church chose December 25th as the day celebrated as Christmas, and there's this entire historical account here. George Washington, if you had a Christmas tree in your house, you would be thrown into jail because it was against the law to bring the customs of the pagan nations into this country. This is George Washington one of the, the first president of the United States. Throughout the ages, Gentile nations have been obsessed with desecrating the Temple Mount, the footstool of our Elohim. It was there that Antiochus erected the image to Zeus, and it was there that the Roman Emperor Adrian, who constructed a temple to Jupiter, today the Temple Mount is desecrated with the shrines to Allah, the god of the crescent moon, along with other images of jealousy. This pattern is to continue as another Hanukkah is yet to come in the future. Scripture tells us that the events of Hanukkah are merely a shadow of events at the end of this age. Daniel prophesied that many within Israel will again sign a covenant or security agreement with a Gentile ruler. A, a wicked ruler as known as Armelius by Jewish theologians as the Antichrist by Christians. And we know this as the seed of Esau. The confirmation of the covenant will start the clock ticking for the three and a half year period spoken in Daniel's 70th week. This covenant is called a covenant with death. Isaiah 28 verse 15. We'll be out. It will be an outward sign of the apostasy of the nation, apostasy of the nation. In their blindness, they will turn to a Gentile, the son of Edom. We, we need to really pay attention, guys. A leader for peace instead of to the one true Elohim. A Levitical hierarchy will emerge in this season as well. A great deception is on the horizon. At the midpoint, 3.5 years, Jerusalem will be captured and oppressed by the Gentiles, Luke 21. Then Antichrist will be revealed for who he is, and he will declare himself to be the God manifest, or epiphanies once again, and demand the worship of the world, as seen in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Like Antiochus Epiphanes, he will desecrate the rebuilt altar temple with his idolatrous, idolatrous image. The dome of the rock is there, and inside the dome of the rock it says, Allah has no son. 
rendering it utterly desolate. You guys understand all of this type of stuff. In conclusion, with some of these details of Hanukkah, Hanukkah stands as a heroic reminder of courageous and enduring faith in Elohim. But Hanukkah is also a reminder of the faithfulness of Elohim. Satan, through Antiochus Epiphanes, had planned to destroy Elohim's word and his people through assimilation and annihilation, and he still does to this day. He, excuse me, had he been successful, there would have been no more Jewish people at that time. No Messiah to come, and most tragically of all, no redemption for any one of us. Men and women would be forever lost in sin without hope, and so a great miracle did happen there. Now look at this. Here's my interpretation. It is not a cruise of oil that was made up by the rabbis. The cruise of oil was actually made up. But look at this. But there was oil there. Do you guys know that? There was oil. There was oil. And I'll, sh I'll tell you where it was at. It is not the cruise of oil, but Elohim's faithfulness to his people and his messianic promise that continue to give true significance to Hanukkah today as we've seen through the heroic efforts of the Maccabean brothers. The eight-day supply of oil was in them. They had, how do we know it's eight days? Read 1 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 56 to 59. It was an actual event that they observed for eight days. Do you have what it takes to stand against the great deception that will occur in a winter season? Look inside of your heart and rededicate the altar of your soul that has been fed lies and adorned with the stamp of paganism. Cry aloud to the Elohim of justice and vengeance and ask for his mercy and forgiveness presented to us all. Hanukkah, which means dedication. This word is seen 11 times in Scripture, 10 times in the Tanakh, and only one time in Yohanan, chapter 10, verse 22. And the big rebuke comes while Yeshua observed Hanukkah. We don't know that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. All it says that he was up in the temple grounds at that time in John chapter 10, verse 22. It was the Feast of Dedication. We don't know exactly what was happening, and that's left up. I think the Father wants us to pull the deeper essence of these things out. The first time this word is seen is in Numbers chapter 7, the very place where the ancient Sulfagil scale was rediscovered. Talking about the, the dedication. Numbers 7, 84 and 88. The next place is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 9. These are in the connection to the altar being dedicated. So when an altar is dedicated, that's why they would bring gifts. The gifts actually weren't presents. They would bring some kind of food to the, the teachers of the time, and then it transitioned into gifts and so on and so forth. But in remembrance of the dedication of the rededication of the altar, gifts were brought. In Ezra 6 and Psalm 30, Hanukkah is connected to the dedication of the house of Yah. In Nehemiah, the connection to the wall of Jerusalem. And in Daniel chapter 3, verse 2 to 3, the dedication of the image. And then John 10, 22, Yeshua on Solomon's porch during Hanukkah. So we have the altar, the wall, the house, and the image, and then the sun. So if you look at this, the altar, I don't know if I have it here, no. You have the altar, the wall, the house, and then the image, and then you have Yeshua. So between, what stands between the altar, the wall, and the house of Yah is an image that needs to be removed. That's standing between the coming of Yeshua with, for His bride and the bride herself, and that image is going to be removed. That image today is called the New World Order System. Look at the order of this amazing event. This empire world system known as the New World Order is completely connected to this image that Daniel is talking about. So let's move ahead. I'm almost done. I just want to give you some insights here. So look at this. Let's see what we have here. Looking at the first verse of our Torah portion. Let's read it together. I have it up there for you guys on the count of three. One, two, three. Vayhi miketz shenataim yamin uparoch and it was at the end of two years of days that Pharaoh was dreaming. The highlighted letters gives us the Hebrew word vayamashach, which means, and he anointed. So this word is used where Moshe anointed the Mishkan and Aaron for service. 
Oil and anointing can always be connected to Hanukkah. Hanukkah is connected with the anointing, and that's the most important thing. It is because of an eight-day miracle of oil that was used, or was it because it was an anointing that was upon a few individuals that stood for the presence and the taking back of the Temple Mount? Later on, we discover another connection to the words of Yosef in chapter 41, verse 33, which says this. Let's read it together so you guys can learn. Ve'ata yire paro ish navon vecham, which says this. And now let Pharaoh seek out a discerning and wise man. The phrase wise man alludes to Hanukkah since the lights are connected to wisdom. The highlighted letters gives us the Hebrew word shmone, which means eighth. As in the traditional rabbinic eight days of the cruise of oil. The traditional, but the, 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 it's traditional with the oil, but the eight days you can find in 1 Maccabees right there. Chapter 4, verse 56 to 49. 59. So I'm going to move ahead to this next one that one of the rabbis was talking about. On the 24th, the Battle of the Maccabees took place. And there are 24 Hebrew letters. I forget the rabbi's name, Edna. What's his name? Ra Ra Rachin? Raskin. I've heard him before. He has a distinct voice. It doesn't match the way he looks for some reason. Yeah. But look at this. On the 24th, the Maccabeans battle took place. There's 24 letters in the part of Baruch, let's say it together. Where did I put it here? Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed, which means blessed be his glorious name and his kingdom forever and ever. We just said it with the Shema. So on the 24th, the battle took place. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Blessed be his glorious name and his kingdom forever and ever. The victory really comes when we understand the Baruch Shem Kevod I put. In the glory of his name. What does it mean to be in the glory of his name? It means you have exited this fleshly stronghold and have been clothed in his name. So look at the next one. I think I have it. Oh, it's still there. Okay. On the 25th, we have the actual celebration of this historical account. In the Shema, there's 25 Hebrew letters, if you count them. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. On the 26th of Kislev, we have the dwelling of victory in the valley, the rededication of the altar, and the overflow of the anointing of Yah, and even the oil, I guess, if that's what they found. The 15 letters we see in allusion to Hanukkah, the Hashemin, or the oil. The actual oil, and I think I'm going to have it up here in a second. The actual oil for what is being given. The value of Hashemin is 395, which gives us the value of the power of Melchizedek. So the anointing to overcome the image and the paganism of the day is the strength of the Melchizedek anointing that needs to be upon our life. All right? As the anointing was done with oil, we see this illusion of Hanukkah dedication. Yes, there are many arguments over all of this Hanukkah, but I'm, I'm going to skip something here. There's arguments over this, and there's names of people that are really out there, even on Facebook, sending a lot of different things to kind of bash, but we need to focus on the actual essence of Hanukkah, the rededication of our, of our spirit man. And look at in Proverbs, I think. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, it says this, For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is a light. The commandment is a lamp and the Torah is a light. And our, our soul is the lamp of Yah. Our soul is the lamp of Yah. I want to give you guys this too because the, what is this called here? It's a dreidel that is used, right? It's a dreidel that's used. But let's look at, you guys know about the letters of the dreidel? The noon, the gimel, the shin, and the hay. So watch this, look at this. The letters of the gimel. By tradition, the dreidel has four faces. The first thing one notices about the dreidel is that each of the dreidel's four faces has one of the letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet inscribed on it. The four letters are what? Nun, Gimel, Nun, Shin, Hey, which gives us the acronym of Nes Gadol Hayasham, which means this, a great miracle occurred there. So the letters of the dreidel gives us the revelation of a great miracle occurred there. 
The letters of the dreidel also gives us 358, which is the value of Mashiach, the anointed one, as well as Goshen, as you guys could see. So there's, there's a lot when it comes to this in this Torah portion. Remember what I said, I'm going to continue with chapter 42, the rest of this Torah portion we can't get into with next week's. I just think they go together to see the reunion of, um, of the brothers of Joseph. And I want to give you guys this. All right, so the same letters that are on the dreidel are actually acronyms as well for the nefesh, say nefesh. The goof, that's one of the Hebrew words for a body. The sechel, which is the intellect, and hakol, which means uh, everything that can be joined above. The spirit, the intellect, and the body all connected. The name Goshen or Goshna in Hebrew is only found twice in the Torah and hence at the two Mashiachs, Ben David and Ben Yosef. By Joseph reuniting with Jacob, the spirit of Mashiach was restored and the flow through Joseph could go to the Israelites instead of the Egyptians who had been the previous beneficiaries. All right, so we see that. So the Nes, say Nes Gadol, Nes Gadol Hayasham, which means a great miracle occurred here. So let's look at another one real quick and then I'm going to close, all right? <clears throat> the second instant Goshen is mentioned is in Breshi chapter 46, verse 29, where Joseph, he... He gets a hold of the, his chariot, and he is on his way. This is next week's Torah portion. He's on his way to be reunited with his father, Jacob. This is where Goshna, Jacob, is the one who created this place for the safe haven of the children of Israel. Goshen was a very special place where all the Israelites would dwell. In chapter 45, verse 3, we have the Hebrew phrase given, and it says this, Joseph said to his brothers, he reveals himself, I am Joseph, revealing the very essence of who he is to the children of Israel. The Hebrew Roots Movement is a return to the pure stream of Scripture, truth, and the walking in the spirit of Yah Elohim where we, were, we are all intended to obey. All right, so um, I think I should close in just a second. I want to get to this because uh, something that, that Jacob, excuse me, that Joseph's going to say, I want to give you, there's a lot in this that's just so beautiful. But Joseph, remember his brothers come, he recognizes them in chapter 42. And I'll get more into this in connecting the two por the Torah portions. But he says something so profound. He says, you guys are spies. He calls them meraglim. Atem, Meraglim Atem. But here's the fascinating thing. Meraglim, right here, for spies, he was really saying this. Mivne, from the sons, Rachel of Rachel, Ganav, you kidnapped Lachachot and sold Yishmaelim to the Ishmaelites, Mitzmarimah, into Egypt. What he was saying, you guys are spies, what he was really revealing is this, you guys took from one of the sons of Rachel, who were the sons of Rachel? Joseph and Benjamin. You kidnapped one of the sons of Rachel and you sold him to the Ishmaelites who wound up sending him down into Mitzrayim. So in the wisdom of Yosef, his statement was convicting and he used the phrase that brought evidence of his brother's crimes. And it was from the sons of Rachel that Yosef and Benjamin, that a theft or a kidnapping took place, and Yosef was sold to the Ishmaelites and sent down into Mitzrayim. And we'll look at that next week. So I'm going to close right now. But just a kind of a, a thought to look at that Joseph's revealing the beauty of redemption. But we can also see something even with Hanukkah that the whole focus of Hanukkah is not receiving any kind of gifts or anything. It's not focusing on going out, doing what we did on Christmas, and, and stressing out, getting all these things. The true focus is the rededication of the heart and soul of men. It's to rededicate your, all, your heart to the Father and let the oil of that anointing come through your life so that you can impact other people 
and other people can be impacted as well. All right, so that's it. I'll stop there. I can't keep going. I got something else, so that's it.